Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this installment of the Auschwitz Speaker Series. My name is Jessica Rockhold, and I'm the Executive Director of the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. Now, on behalf of MCHE and Union Station, Kansas City, we'd just like to express how appreciative we are for you coming to learn with us today. Um, this is a webinar. So after Dr. Heikova speaks, you'll be able to put your questions into the Q&A feature of this webinar, and we will be moderating those to her at the end of her presentation. And before we, we get to that presentation, though, it's my honor to introduce you to my friend, George Costello, who is the president and CEO of Union Station. So I mean, let's try that. Thank you, Jessica. I wish I could uh, know how to work a computer. It's always kind of fun. I feel like a bad Saturday Night Live skit. It's like just unmute yourself. But uh, thank you for those kind words. And uh, on behalf of all of us, our board of directors and our very talented staff, I'd like to say thank you for allowing us to partner with you in one of the most historic and uh, truly transformational exhibitions that we have ever had the opportunity to be involved with. And I credit a good portion of that success to our partnership with the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. When we chose to bring this to exhibition to Kansas City, the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education was the first group that we reached out to for advice, for guidance, and to be able to support their mission and their work for nearly 25 years in this community. Well, over 25 years, then it was 25 years. But being able to work with them to allow us all to tell the story, the right story at the right time for all of our community has really been rewarding. And the numbers have spoken for themselves. Nearly 177,000 people have already purchased tickets to this exhibition. We are sold out through the, uh, all, all the way up into the holiday season. And working with the Midwest Center, we were able to create these very important and poignant converse, community conversations to make a difference. Uh, nearly 20 of these presentations were created. We've already presented nearly eight of them. When we look at the return in our community with well over, as I said, close to 180,000 people purchasing tickets from over 49 states uh, have come to Kansas City to learn and understand the workings and the challenges and the horror of the Holocaust and to make our community a better place. Uh, on behalf of our professional team, Thank you for allowing us to be part of this. Please watch our social and digital channels for more information. I think sometime this week, we will be making available more tickets in the mornings. Uh, so be looking at that. So if you have been trying to get a ticket, start hitting our account uh, on uh, Thursday morning and you may have a chance to uh, get uh, a nine o'clock timeframe. Jessica. Shelly, thank you for what you've done for our community. And we look forward to working with you till the end of this exhibition and well beyond. So enjoy this conversation, learn from it, and let us make a difference in our community. Thank you. Thank you, George. This partnership has been the most remarkable partnership. We've been able together to accomplish so much and one of the primary objectives was making sure that this exhibition, as remarkable as it is, did not stand completely alone, that we surrounded it with rich and important educational programming. And so as we started to think about what topics we would bring into this community conversation series, uh, we wanted to think very broadly about Auschwitz and what that meant in the scope of the Holocaust. For us as Holocaust educators, it was immediately important that we address terrorism and the unique nature that that camp slash ghetto served in the Nazi system and how it related to Auschwitz. Uh, as we know, the, there is a unique Czech family camp where the deportees from Terezin go to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And so we sought out an expert on Terezin 
And I'm so pleased to introduce you today to Dr. Anna Haikova, who is with us um, from Great Britain this, this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Haikova is the Associate Professor of Modern Continental European History at Warwick University, University of Warwick. And she is the author of the book, The Last Ghetto, The Everyday History of Theresian Shock, which she is holding up right now. And I am going to turn this over to Dr. Haikova. Thank you so much for being with us. And you are muted. <laughs> yes. Um, so thank you so much to Dr. Shelley Klein for inviting me and thank you so so much to you, Jessica Rockhold, for the introduction. It is a little bit bittersweet because I really wish I were in the US and uh, of course as a European I can't and I don't know when I will be able to go. So I'm very happy to be with you but I would so happily be with you there there. Uh, to not technical, but introductory remarks. Um, I'm recovering from an illness um, and it's 8 p.m. here. So I'm a little bit under the weather. Um, so I'm not in my top form and I'm really sorry. Uh, the other topic uh, that I want to point out may be obvious to you, but I do want to remark on it. Of course, the whole topic of my research, I'm a Holocaust historian and of my book is not exactly cheerful, but I was painfully aware writing um, these parts of the book uh, to chapter six on transports and writing the talk for today, it's hands down the saddest one. And I don't want to sugarcoat it and I will serve it to you as is. Now, unlike some other speakers in this series that I'm honored to be part of, I'm a historian of the Jewish Holocaust history. I look at victims. I also sometimes look at the Germans, but mostly I look at the victims. So in this talk, I will look at the transports, how they were experienced by the prisoner society in Theresienstadt, how they made sense of transports, what it meant to them, what it did to the mentality. I will explore what people's behavior can, uh, during the transports can tell us about kinship, agency and powerlessness, which are some of the key concepts in Holocaust studies. Now, I will start sharing my screen. And I also put the screen on. Well, good. Um, and before I come to the actual story, I have to offer a little bit of background on Theresienstadt. It was set up in November 1941, and it was the last ghetto to be liberated by the Red Army on 9th May 1945, uh, which is also why I gave the book the title, uh, The Last Ghetto. And if you are counting, indeed, this November, it will be the 80th anniversary when the SS set up uh, the ghetto. Um, it was from the beginning a transit ghetto, that is, uh, people were sent to Theresienstadt, they were held here for some time, some few days, some years, and they were uh, then sent uh, to other destinations uh, in uh, the Nazi occupied East, to annihilation camps, uh, to other ghettos, uh, or uh, to concentration camps. The SS did control the ghetto, but did not actually administer it. The uh, Germans outsourced the administration of the ghetto to the Jewish self-administration, and particularly today, the role of the Jewish self-administration will be quite important. There may be 30 people uh, working for the SS uh, who were present at any time, and there could be weeks where the victims in Theresienstadt would walk around without seeing a single German. And when I say German in this context, I mean uh, one of the SS. In fact, some of them were uh, Austrian. The guarding of the ghetto, and you can see that Theresienstadt is uh, one of the Wobbenian fortresses set up in the um, 18th century, um, was quite easily to be done because you had the fortifications. So you just needed to have gendarmes here and here and here at the uh, four access points to guard off that people cannot uh, escape. One of the best known, um, and yeah, here is a map. Uh, I had a map drawn by my wife who is an architect uh, for the book. You can find it in the beginning uh, of the book, the uh, surrounding of Theresienstadt and then Theresienstadt proper, but you can also look up both of them on the website that I had built uh, for the book at thelastghetto.org and you find there also images in color and in better recognition in case you want to study it because 
I know that lots of people who will be using my book are the descendants of the victims. One of the best known, uh, one of the best known uh, representatives of Jewish, the Jewish self-administration and a bit of a, a synonym uh, for Jewish collaboration is Benjamin Mummerstein, the Viennese rabbi who survived and therefore could be uh, charged. And um, I had quite a lot to do with Mummerstein and the story surrounding him and people's feelings around him. And also with this talk, I will try to show you a little bit um, how the leeway of the unfortunate people who worked as the prisoner functionaries, as the Jewish functionaries uh, looked like. Um, what is quite important for our understanding of the role of the Jewish self-administration is they were not equals of the SS. They were not the cooperation partners. The SS was not interested in the mentalities and in the well-being of their counterpoints. This is the asymmetry of power. The Jewish functionaries spent days and weeks and the whole time obsessing about the liking or disliking um, of their counterparts, of the Germans. And the Germans did not waste a single thought on them. And this is how asymmetry of power works. In terms of transport, the SS had certain decisions to do about them. Most importantly, the decision that people will be sent somewhere. But then the actual work, the actual labor on the transport was done by the uh, Jews themselves. And this is um, maybe quite a technical question, but I think immensely important to understand not only Theresienstadt, but by extension, the situation of many Jewish functionaries, but also the rank and file are victims. And also to contribute to the sense of leeway, of agency, and then the bitter fights after the war. So up to October 44, specifically the 4th of October 1944, it was the SS that ordered the transport will leave, how many people will go on it, they decided where the transport is going to and sometimes informed the Jews and sometimes did not and sometimes lied to them. And what groups should be put on the transport, say the young or the older, people with TB should be protected or put on, the Czech Jews should be put in such and such proportion or not. But one group that was protected at one transport could be specifically selected for the transport next time. And this applied for the people with tuberculosis whom I just mentioned. But the actual job of filling the transport list with actual people came to the Jewish self-administration. This is something that will only change in October 44 under the tenure of Benjamin Mummerstein, the last elder of the Jews. In terms of destinations and decisions where the transports will go, it largely overlaps um, with the deportation goals from Greater Germany, as described by Alfred, um, Alfred Gottwald, who passed away about five years ago, and Diana Schule. And in that respect, they are different from the deportations from France, from France, from the Netherlands, and of course, from the general government. The SS decided in few cases about what groups and what individuals will be included. And one group are the so-called Weisungen. These are specific people who the SS wanted to get rid of. One group that I looked at in my book um, quite a bit are Jewish informers, Jews who volunteered to inform, to denounce on their fellow Jews for the Nazis so that they hoped for a certain level of protection. In the end, pretty much everybody on this group uh, was sent on the very last transport to Auschwitz. And when you were Weisung, and alongside with the informers, it could be people who knew too much about the SS, who were um, dealing with them, uh, helping them in their corruption, people who were forced uh, to do for them, um, maybe the eye doctor or something, or also people who already were forced to work towards the Gestapo uh, in the cities and towns before the deportation to Theresienstadt. On all of these people, the SS kept the list and eventually they were selected as Weisung uh, to Auschwitz. That meant that they were sent with a special car on the train and they were shot upon arrival uh, to Auschwitz. And here you can see uh, the handwritten remarks of Viktor Kendem, one of the um, Jewish functionaries who ran uh, part of the transport to, the, um, to Auschwitz, um, how he wrote Denunz, or in Czech, the abbreviation for denouncer uh, on the list. And these are people 
who largely are completely erased from history, who are kind of described as the complete evil. And one of the things that I kind of tried to raise in the book is, isn't it the complete erasure if you do not give people the voice and just kind of describe them as the ultimate evil? Wouldn't it be more interesting to ask who were these people? What did they do? How did they help the Nazis run the ghetto? And what moved them uh, to uh, do that? Another group who was included specifically uh, both by the SS but also by the Jewish administration were people who were sentenced to prison sentences longer than two weeks by the ghetto court. That is in Stadt similarly to Lodz or Warsaw or other ghettos, as Svenja Betka has described, had its own uh, legal system and they could punish people for theft and other crimes uh, for prison sentences or being stripped uh, of certain better jobs or, or food. And the sentences that were longer than two weeks meant that these people were sent uh, to Auschwitz. However, not as by Zoom. Um, it makes sense to have a look at kind of the meaning of deportations from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz in its chronology. I mentioned that Theresienstadt was set up in November 41 and some five weeks after it was set up in early January 42, the first transport was sent to Riga. So in the first 11 months of Theresienstadt, transport are not sent to Auschwitz, they are sent to Riga. Uh, to Estonia, uh, to two annihilation camps, to Maitrostinets and to Treblinka, and also to Warsaw Ghetto and to the small ghettos in Lublin district. And then starting in October uh, 42, up till the end of the transports uh, to Auschwitz in uh, end of October 44, which is when the crematoria will be dismantled in Auschwitz, they only go uh, to Auschwitz. So altogether, 87,000 people um, were sent uh, from Theresienstadt to the east and from that something over the half uh, were sent to Auschwitz, 46,000. Uh, about 4,000 people survived uh, the deportations to the east, um, large majority of them people from uh, the Auschwitz transports. So this was quite a little bit of technicality, but I very firmly believe it's important for our understanding of the mentality um, of uh, the Jewish functionaries. And a little bit more technicality will follow. Uh, many of you will be quite painfully aware of the bitter debates about the Jewish councils, about the Junarete, by Sarah Trunk, by Hannah Arendt. Um, but also if you're interested in the history of East Germany and of communists, uh, the reliable role of the Kapos in Buchenwald and uh, the decision who will go on the transport and who will be saved. And I believe, and I built here on the work of people like Doron Rabinovich, Beate Maya, or Dan Dina, that it makes sense to look at the leeway of these people on more detail, but also to understand that the Jewish functionaries always operated in the assumption of references that they knew that they are useful. They could not imagine that the end goal for the Germans is the annihilation. So in everything I describe, the end game is that people are sent to forced labor and maybe the elderly are going to be uh, killed. How did it look like when a transport was sent away? The commandant called for the Jewish elder and gave him instructions who is going to be protected, who is going to be specifically singled out for transport, uh, what proportions of ethnicity. Um, and many of you will be aware that uh, while Theresienstadt um, always had a um, largest group of Czech Jews, it also had Jews from Germany, Netherlands, Austria, Slovakia, and Hungary. And um, rather than an absolute key that say 48% of the prisoners in Theresienstadt are Czech Jews and therefore 84, 48% of the people on the transport would be Czech Jews, this is also something that was uh, decided by the SS. If it was not, then uh, the Jewish self-administration putting together the transport decided alongside the nationality team. And the Jewish elder then passed on these instructions that he received from the commandant to Wilhelm Kantor, who was the head of the transport unit in the central registry. Uh, Theresienstadt had quite an effective, but also quite an overgrown chief Jewish self-administration. And I spent the first chapter of the book explaining and discussing how it worked. Um, so if you're interested in that, I also have an organizational sketch of the many, many departments uh, on the website that I mentioned uh, in the beginning. 
And then Willem Kantor called for the meeting of the large commission in which all the representatives of the various labor units in the Jewish of administration, the medical unit, the technical department, the youth care, um, and so on and so on, came and represented day workers. All of the prisoners in Theresienstadt were read alongside the departments for which they work, because there was an overall duty uh, for everyone to work for people between the age of 18 and 65. The ages have moved. So the, trans, uh, the leaders of these departments had lists of all of their workers and read them out. And these people were ranked alongside what for Theresienstadt was called dispensability or indispensability, how important they were ranked for the departments. And the people who were ranked as lesser important were then used to fill the transport lists. Um, the large commission, which was led, and here you have uh, Otto Zucker, um, um, met and then put the transports together. Uh, something that was quite important, I do want to come back to this chronology in a little bit, um, um, decided until four. 44, something that they believed, and indeed very much it was, something to protect the mental well-being, but also the families uh, among the people in the in Theresienstadt, namely that families would be deported as family units and they would not be torn apart, something that was called the concept, uh, the rule of the family in Sereisung. So the parents and the children up to 18 years of age would be deported together. Um, this is something that will then change with the transports after the 4th of October 1944. By the way, the reason of the um, family units is also the reason why the ghetto court um, allows for divorces, but also allows for marriages, because if you are married to someone, they can protect you from transports, but you are then also bound to go with them. And this is one of the big decisions that people make in, the, in Theresienstadt. With whom do you, I want to go on transport? With my parents? With my friends? Of his my lover. Uh, women were usually, uh, their status was defined by that of their husband. We have a couple of women who were ranked as so indispensable that they could offer a protection for their husbands, but largely women's um, uh, protection was dictated by that of their husbands. And single women then belonged to Edith Einstein's department for working uh, women. Um, First, the department leaders reported all of the workers who were seen as indispensable, and this reading could last a whole night, sometimes a couple of days. The Jewish elder and his deputies were not present and um, intervened uh, only if the commission uh, could not decide. The list on top of this kind of reading of the dispensable and the dispensable names, and please think with everything quotation marks, because we don't talk here about milk, we talk here about human beings. Um, unless the commandant said otherwise, was uh, put together according to the key of the nationalities, the percentage of the Czechs, of the German, of the Dutch, and so on. Alongside the Raj Commission, there were also national committees uh, that decided who of the Czechs, of the German, of the Dutch, and of the Austrians are seen as particularly important and worth saving, and people who are seen as uh, more dispensable. And top of everything um, that I've just described, uh, the important Jewish functionaries, all of them had the uh, personal protection lists. For example, Rudolf Bergmann, who was one of the important Czech Jews, the assimilationists from Prague, um, his list has put, um, the list of Rudolf Bergmann has survived and it lists 77 names. If there was not enough time, because not always did the commandant give uh, the Jewish self administration three or four days to list to put these people together. Uh, there was a small commission uh, that uh, kind of cut down the whole process a little bit shorter. And on top of these various protection groups and whatnot, uh, there were a couple of groups that were always protected or were protected for a long time. And you may have heard about the so called Aufbau Commando or the construction detail. 1300 largely young men from Prague who were sent with the first to transport to Theresienstadt to set it up and who were rewarded um, with being offered protection that lasted largely um, up to December 1943. And not only them, again, with the family unit uh, principle, 
also uh, their wives and their children up to the age of um, 18. And after the list of the thousand people was set together, and usually uh, the SS asked for thousand people, on top of that, uh, the SS asked for 20% for standby because many of the people would be exempt. They could apply some way uh, or other, or they would not show up or they would be seriously sick. And if you were seriously sick, and this was another a factor where the Jewish self-administration showed humanity, unlike the SS, um, people could be um, exempt. So therefore there was another 20% uh, to 100 people on the standby list who would replace whoever uh, would be uh, petitioned out. Now, um, I have promised you to have a look with you at the chronology, um, because after all we are here also to talk about Auschwitz. The first transport that is sent to uh, from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz um, is the transport BY. Now, uh, all of the arriving transports to Theresienstadt and all of the departing transports from Theresienstadt are given by the central registry and abbreviation. So if you deal with Theresienstadt, all of the people in Theresienstadt have at least very one um, uh, kind of transport number, which is something like the ID or uh, in American context, the ID of your driving license. And since almost everybody was sent to the East, they have two transport numbers. And um, if I talk, when I talk with uh, my colleagues who work on Theresienstadt or with people whose relatives were deported to Theresienstadt, um, it is uh, among others, this number that indicates when were you sent to the East and how good or how bad were your chances of surviving. Because the LA was sent to Auschwitz, the worse your chances, obviously, even though this is a little bit more complicated. So the first transport is the one uh, on the 26th of October, 1942. Then uh, in uh, January 43, um, uh, for 10 days, 7,000 people were sent to Auschwitz. Um, we, we have a couple of survivors who were sent uh, to clean uh, the rubble of the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, in early September 1943, and soon we will have the anniversary of that, the SS sent the first 5,000 people uh, to the family camp. Not all of them were Czech, um, and you have heard about the family camp. So here we have three waves of transports to the family camp, first in September 43, second in December 43, again 5,000 people, and finally in May 44, 7,500 people. So altogether it's 17,500 people, in the first 5,000, almost everybody was murdered in gas chambers in um, March 44, and whoever was still alive by July 44 um, could go through selection and was sent to forced labor in concentration camps. And as Miroslav Karni and others pointed out, um, actually the best survival chance came from the family transports, um, uh, from the family camp transports, especially from May. Uh, 44. And my current work um, is actually linked to the family tra camp and to the transports to Hamburg, so I can definitely confirm it uh, for the group of the 600 younger women from the family camp who were sent to Hamburg, from whom about 85% survived. And the last wave of transports were the fall transports of 44, about which I've been talking over and over when the SS, the first three transports were set together by the Jewish self-administration and then the SS took over and I will speak about that in a second. Now, so much in terms of technicality, but I find it immensely important because then it helps us understand um, and cast light how all of this uh, was perceived um, by the people in Theresienstadt. What people thematized over and over was who were the own who were transported on the cost of the others. Um, and here we have a good example by the house elder, an older man from Prague called Arnold Klein, who during the January 43 transports to Auschwitz on the 19th of January wrote, and I quote, tomorrow they will carry out the transport orders for 2000 men, for people from the protectorate under 65 years of age. The inhabitants of the protectorate are very stricken while the Jews from the Reich, that is German Jews, gloat a bit and carry their heads high. There is a certain animosity between the Czech Jews and those from Germany. One cannot get along very well with the Gnale, always patronizing character. In the house, the women are lazy, demanding and uncleanly, and unhappy because they did not take along their Aryan maids. The men 
with few exceptions, are unintelligent, nonchalant, a pity, and quarrelsome. They were not pleasant already before the ghetto, but here they turn nauseating. At the same time, they are orthodox and bigoted, and they get offended when we smile over it. End of quote. I'm sure you are as taken aback listening to this as I was when I came across it in the Prague Jewish Museum when a client's diary is kept. Because Klein's portrayal of right German Jews is a veritable diatribe. His attack was brought about by the perceived injustice that Czech Jews left on transport while the German Jews were saved. But when a few days later, and you know, this is not a decision of the German Jews, this is the decision of the commandant. But when a few days later in the next transport, it was also the inclusion of the German and Austrian Jews, Klein did not mention it with a single sentence. He only spoke about that his own group and the Czech Jews are included. And I do not mention it here only because the quote is so interesting and it offers us a window into um, some of the conflicts and sense of today's Inchtab, but also how the own group is made and how the other is created. Another category of commonality was seniority. And if you are interested in uh, prison research, you will know how incredibly important it is uh, for people in prisons who has been there longer and therefore is uh, more deserving. So even if somebody came from Hamburg or Vienna and met someone in uh, Theresienstadt who was Czech and arrived after them, in a way they were perceived as more important, more deserving, having more social capital because of their seniority. At departure, most most important was speaking and saying farewell to friends. Friends and family came to help. Uh, they um, helped to pack, they helped decide where to get bread, where to get warm clothing, what is useful to pack. And people described over and over how certain food things that were uh, perceived as particularly useful to take away became much more expensive, potatoes or bread um, or um, uh, margarine. And uh, people bequeathed to their friends um, uh, the power of a attorney to receive parcels from whoever would send them uh, these parcels. And then they were sent to the so-called Schleuse, uh, to the holding place uh, where people had to collect before they will mount the train together with the standby. And we can get the best sense of the mentality and experience of the Schleuse from a long example from the diary of Eva Mendlova after the war, Rubichko. It's quite a long example, but I find it immensely powerful. And I also want to explain, she talks here about Mama, and uh, Mama is not her mother, it's the mother of her boyfriend and after the war husband uh, who uh, emigrated uh, to Great Britain. So it's a long quote that I will read slowly. The whole street was lined up for the transport when I came home from work. It was very cold. Burger, the SS man, behaved terribly. He acted like a beast, slapping people who got in his way, pushing people into carts with or without their luggage. He didn't care. In the end, he needed more people for the transport. So he just took anyone walking on the wrong side of the street with no luggage. And those who had luggage, had their backpacks torn of them because there wasn't enough room. 2,200 people left, and the next 2,200 were called for Thursday for the 16th. There was a huge record in the Magdeburg. Magdeburg Barak is the seat of the Jewish self-administration. Boga, the commandant, had lists brought of all the administration, production workers, mobilization of labor, provisions, and so on. In short, of everybody who had been most protected, he chose people completely arbitrarily, names he didn't like, and they were simply Vaison. Egon came to me at 7 a.m. His mother is in the transport. He's volunteered and asked me to help him pack. Of course, I helped him all morning. Then I went home to check if he weren't in it too. Mama is in the reserve, with the she means the standby list. He didn't expect that. Mama had finally calmed down in the last few days and was even glad she had decided to stay here with us. She couldn't have helped Lotte anyway. Lotte is energetic and brave enough, but she certainly would have volunteered to be with us if we had to go. And now she's in the transport. So now again, we packed.
By six o'clock, it was 99% sure mama would be staying. I went to get her some dinner and meant to pick her up from the sloughs at seven. Then I heard that the entire standby list had to line up. Some said it was just survey them. Others said there were 500 people missing. It was a horrible mess. Women began to wail. I stood there as if hit by lightning. I looked and looked and couldn't find mama. Did she have everything with her? Her sleeping bag? Is there anybody able to help her? I ran to the Jäger barracks. There sat Borger at the table with an overhead lamp and two coal ovens at either side. He had an entire staff of people waiting for a sign from the Lord and Master. Poor mama, it was dark farther back. The bushes were crawling with people hiding to escape their fate. People in the Jäger barracks hid under beds, behind beds, under planks, on the toilet. There were entire families hiding, and if they were called, they simply did not come. It seemed to work. Mama didn't hide, for sure. Mama would go immediately if they called her just once. If only I could find her. If only I could see her and help her. She's so alone. Heinebrock won't be able to take care of her. He doesn't know her number. Well, the Hella won't be able to take care of her either in this terrible mess. If only I could get a pair of overalls like the transport helpers. And of course, there is much more. But you see how Mandlova is completely overwhelmed by powerlessness, how she's kind of running the taps in her head, what she could do, but also sees it will not work. And how she sees that other people who are not as nice as her future mother-in-law, who indeed was deported and perished in Auschwitz, and how they are bad, and how her mother-in-law is the nice person who will not bail out, and therefore she will be sent uh, to her death. And um, yeah, it is, it is a horrible quote, and I think it is important to take it as it is. There is nothing to sugarcoat about all that. The travel from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz uh, lasted in um, largely uh, on average three days, uh, usually in cattle cars. A few of the SS men uh, traveled um, alongside and they also checked up on arrival that the people from the last train from the Weisungen were shot on arrival. There were another 60 men from the order police from Prague, Ustin Adlabem or Aussich or Teplice, who also traveled alongside and checked that nobody is escaping. Now, uh, you already kind of get the sense from Mendlova's entry how the rank and file um, uh, prisoners perceived transports as emotionally exhausting, chaotic, but also extremely uh, moments when they had so little uh, agency. But whom they perceived in charge were the Jewish functionaries. But for the Jewish functionaries, uh, the transports were perceived as this exhausting task that was difficult and sad, but also something that they decided and believed that they can do well. Because if someone else did it, and if the Germans did it, it would be much more tragic. After all, they could save the important people. After all, they could see that it's done in an orderly fashion and that trans families are sent uh, together. They could take care that everybody has their luggage, that there is some medical support, that there is a doctor and a nurse because they believed that these people will live, or at least the majority of them will live. And while the Jewish functionaries kind of believe in their task as is, um, and where do we have Otto Zucker? Ah, here we have Otto Zucker. Uh, Otto Zucker um, was perceived very differently. And again, I have a quote from Eva Rubichkova. Wherever Zucker walked or stood, he had a tale of six or seven people behind him, all of them talking at him simultaneously and shouting over each other. He'd throw them out of one door and they would come back in another one. Um, Zucker was eventually sent to Auschwitz and murdered Zerweisung upon arrival, but his colleague, Benjamin Munstein, survived. He was forced to put together the first three transports uh, in fall 44, and eventually the SS took over and he, all he could do is to beg uh, them to save a few people. And people like Amunmestein, the survivors never forgave them that they had the leeway or something that the survivors perceived as leeway and that they said, I cannot help you. So rather than kind of saying uh, or thinking 
who is guilty and what one should have done, I find it much more interesting and also important to ask what is the leeway and where kind of this emotional heft of the reproaches uh, comes from. How could people avoid transports? Um, you heard from Robichkova that some people simply hid and come out only when the transport was over. But another important uh, moment was uh, the transport physicians who could decide who is too sick to be sent uh, to Auschwitz. Some of the Jewish physicians like uh, Rheinisch uh, were perceived as corrupt and uh, would sell uh, kind of exemptions against quite high sums. Some of the people uh, did it uh, in a more honest way. But you can see between Westerbork, Berlin and Theresienstadt how the thought and the knowledge of certain mechanisms to avoid transports, how to get extremely high fever was shared. And this is something that I find as fascinating as McCaber. And it's the story uh, of so-called milk shots, because if you get a subcutan milk shot, your fever uh, gets really, really high, but also it can get so high that you will have a heart failure. So some people survived because they're friends, so they themselves uh, got um, a subcutan shot um, of milk. Um, the BY transport that I mentioned to you earlier, uh, the last one from October 42, was also a moment of an extremely dangerous game of the uh, first elder of the Jews, Jakob Edelstein, because he falsified the central registry by 55 names. He listed 55 people who had passed away and put on their corpses on transport. And that allowed him to save 55 people uh, in Theresienstadt. But it also meant that somebody continuously had to falsify uh, the um, uh, central registry in Theresienstadt because every day the Jewish elder had to report to the commandant and put in the list of everybody who was present. Um, eventually, this falsification flew up. And this was one of the reasons uh, why Edelstein was arrested, sent to Auschwitz and murdered. Now, it is worthwhile to contrast what happens in 444 so that we see what was the leeway of the um, uh, elder of the Jews of the Jewish self administration and how the suffering that was horrible before becomes a whole different thing. Because the SS that was intending to close down Theresien Chateau, almost completely close it down, sent with the first two transports young men between the age of 50 including young and fit Jewish functionaries. They promised them that they are going outside of Dresden, but they were actually sent to Auschwitz. They first sent young men away because they hoped that with that, there will be no possibility of uprising in Theresienstadt. The second elder of the Jews, the Berlin man, Paul Epstein, had to prepare the first two transports, but was then arrested and shot at the small fortress, the nearby Gestapo prison. And he was followed by Benjamin Momerstein. The third transport in early October 44 was still prepared by the Jewish self-administration and in fact women whose husbands uh, and sons and brothers were sent to the uh, sent to what they believed was Dresden fought to be included because they did not want to be separated. This is how important it was to keep these uh, family units. So um, we have a memory of this woman who said I fought with others to be included and because I was strong. I was successful and she never saw her husband again. They were not reunited in Auschwitz. He was uh, murdered and she was lucky and survived, but she never saw her husband and had she stayed behind, she would have been protected through her job in Theresienstadt. And since the fourth transport of these 10 transports in uh, fall 44, altogether 18,000 people, it was the SS that organized the transports and they simply sent out lists. They did not pay attention to the family units. They would go through the streets and capture whoever came up to them. They would take people who were disabled, who were uh, mentally ill, people who were dying of tuberculosis, people who even until worst were protected and everybody understood that it's fair. The 17 year old Aliza Ehrmann wrote on the 22nd of October in her diary and I quote, SS swarms, um, SS swarms, of the six to seven year old children alone on the transports, cretinous children, Professor Lieben with open tuberculosis, Hans Stickelmacher, completely lamed with enteritis. There are no uniforms, it is too desolate. End of quote. 
Lily Fantlova, who was the wife of a cook, was the only woman in Terezinch that who gave birth to twins who stayed alive. She was the wife of a cook and therefore she had it relatively good. We have other stories of women who were pregnant with twins, but they could not carry to term uh, and the babies died. She was even so wealthy that, comparably wealthy, that she was able to organize a prem. And in fall 44, she begged the commandant to allow her to take not only the twins, but the prem with her because otherwise, what do you do with two little children? And he said, no because he knew she will not need a pram where she's arriving. And because she had two, two little children, she did not have a chance to survive. And Lily Fantlova and her two little girls were killed. Um, I did tell you it's a really horrible story. And people in Theresien Chat were so shaken, not only because two thirds of them are sent to the East, because old Theresien Chat with social networks and social hierarchies was gone. Mummerstein fought over and over with the commandant and begged and pleaded that he needs certain people to keep the Theresienstadt running. In the end, he was able to keep a few people. He was uh, able to keep one gynecologist and one ophthalmologist. The eye doctor was Julia Polakova. That's actually quite a nice story. Because um, at the same time as I was writing my PhD, I often stayed with Sirena Sheklova, a dear friend of mine in, in Prague. And in fact, she always lived in the same uh, house when she got married, her husband moved in with her. And the best friend and neighbor of her late mother was Julia Polakova, the ophthalmologist, who thanks to Momoštein, who fought for her, was able to come back and die as an old lady who always fought with her best friend, Sirena Sheklova's mother. My next point that I want to touch on is kinship and agency. Yes, the Reisenstadt's transports were the worst, the most terrifying on the Reisenstadt when the used habits fell apart. And yet over and over after each transport, people were able to go back to the normal, to the habits as if nothing had happened. And these extreme emotions of panic, fear and powerlessness came over. Men were crying and the decision came over and over with whom are you going to volunteer to go on transport? And for whom are you going to fight that you will stay behind? Benjamin Murmerstein, who was interviewed in the 1970s by Claude Lanzmann, recalled some of the really, really disgruntling and difficult stories from Theresienstadt. And he recalled a young novelist with whom he was friendly. At one point in October 44, uh, this young guy uh, was called for a transport and came to Murmerstein to beg for help. Momishtan was not able to help. And a few hours later, he came, was shining through happiness and said, completely happy, Dr. Momishtan, it's not me, it's my dad. This is what transported to people. The young man was the novelist Mirko Tuma. His father, Rudolf, was deported with the transport ER. Tuma had no control over whether his father would be deported. His sole choice, was consisting from volunteering whether to join or not. Momoštan, of course, witnessed how Tuma was panicking and how he was happy that he was saved. After the war, Tuma treated Momoštan in a markedly ambivalent way because Momoštan was put on a trial and almost sentence. He was eventually acquitted, but not thanks to Tuma's support. There was an unwritten expectation that partners will go together and their children, unless they are married, will go with them. And here you see that Tuma decided to breach against the expectation because he was unmarried. <laughs> I want to share an example of this kind of decision taking and um, difficult uh, obsessing about with whom to go on the example of Ludwig Eckstein, a young communist and an actor. He was, um, his brother in May 44 was called for transport and his girlfriend was not. And he was kind of debating what to do. His parents encouraged him to join with the brother. The girlfriend was saved. Um, he was eventually uh, kind of volunteered to join the brother. The brother was taken out. Ludwig Eckstein stayed on the transport. Um, now what to do? Should he stay with the girlfriend? Should he stay with the brother? What to do? He went to his good friend, Gustav Schorsch, um, a well-liked and much admired uh, director of theater. 
And Eckstein, who uh, was a very charismatic actor, can kind of enact this very much better than I in my following quote. And he says it very charismatically, but also very nobly. He looked me in distance, just like he always did. He told me a sentence which I shall never forget to my death. You know, once in one's life, you get into a situation in which you yourself have to find a solution. And this situation will show you who you actually are. He gave me his hand and left. And I went voluntarily to Auschwitz." End of quote. Eckstein stressed the decision to go to Auschwitz and what to do as a moral question. It's a moral question with whom you will go on transport. But I don't think that Schorsch and Ludwig Eckstein um, is really about what is the true inside of you. The incident with Mirko Tuma to me demonstrates the extreme stress does not reveal the true self of someone. Rather it showed that people were broken by transports who then spent their whole lives, if they survived to tell the story, to come to terms with what they perceive as their moral lapse. The reactions could encompass blaming the Jewish functionaries, that is shoving the perceived guilt on someone else, never telling the story, changing the story and actually kind of seeing themselves uh, the narrator as a moral hero, or uh, seeing themselves as in charge, or styling themselves completely powerless. As long as the inmates lived in a society they themselves defined, they could exercise an influence over their fate. Transports represented the end of exercising agency. This powerlessness, as Saul Friedland pointed out, is one of the key moments of the experience of the victims of the Holocaust. And I want to offer you, before I come to a conclusion, um, a little reflection on what I think about discussion on powerlessness and agency. Because um, while I would argue that we should not be judging in moral terms the slaps with whom to go on transport, the decisions with whom to go on transport, but other decisions also with whom to be accommodated, with whom to share food, are really important decisions of moments of agency in today's Instadt. While in retrospect, it may make may have made little difference if people will actually survive or not. This is the leeway as it's perceived by the prisoners in Therese Inchat and also by extension everywhere else. So if you want to get to understanding how agents worked in extremists, we need to get into the nitty gritty of the everyday history of the Holocaust and take agency of these people seriously. And also for that you need to kind of change your um, glance, change your horizon, change your perspective and arrive at that. And for that history of everyday life as a methodology is uh, incredibly important. And if you are familiar with uh, Lawrence Langer's concept, um, uh, choiceless choices, you will understand what I'm kind of trying to do here in critiquing it. And with that, I come to a conclusion, to the conclusion. The transports out of Theresienstadt meant the end of the ghetto, but they also offer salient insights about what defined a society. With whom do you go on transport? Kinship? that could be defined biologically with your family, but kinship that could be defined as your friends or as your lover or as your political group. I have some great examples of the communist underground group where um, children told their parents, I will actually go with my communist underground group because I cannot betray the party. And it offers important insights about change of kinship from the biological family into a non-biological thing. And that is kind of linked to my work on queer Holocaust history, but that is a different story. Um, how people perceive the inclusion of groups on transport shows us how groups were constructed and how people were seen as in and out. You kind of see it with the seniors, you see it with the seniority, you see it with the construction of Czech Jews. By the way, Arno Schlein often wrote his diary in German but he writes in German and writes about the German Jews as the wrong ones. And finally, the point on agency. And I think that is something that um, to me remains one of the most important insights of my writing. How can we arrive at conceptualizing agency of these people? Because the majority of them did not survive. And if you measure agency and success um, and control by who survived and who did not, we will actually not be able to grasp it because this is a tragic story. This is why I sometimes start crying when I speak uh, about all this, 
because almost everybody uh, was murdered. And this is why I also dedicated the book to those who did not come back. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hakova. We'll do a, a, just, a, just a few questions if you still feel up to it, um, but we'll try and keep it, keep it a bit short. Um, thank you for that wonderful presentation and a really nice focus on the deportations. Uh, I wonder just as a very broad question, uh, if you could talk to us, this is a very simple question. Uh, the difference between referring to this place as Terzin versus Theresienstadt and what which term you prefer um, as an expert on this place. Ah, thank you. Um, I, I use them synonymously. Um, I, I thought I would put something, but then I was cutting the talk shorter and cut it. The one hill that I am always willing to die on is that it was a ghetto and not a concentration camp. And I write about it in the introduction for a number of reasons. This is how the uh, SS called it. It was part of the Zentralstelle für die Auswanderung, the Central Office for uh, Jewish uh, Immigration, and it fell under 4B4 of the Rice Security Main Office. Um, the survivors called it uh, the ghetto during the uh, time. And you have the introduction of the term concentration camps only after the war, when uh, the official narrative of the real sites of suffering by concentration camps, and you see how the survivors start fashioning the experience in uh, Ghetto Theresienstadt, that was a concentration camp. Uh, we have one question from the audience here asking about the length of time between deportations and if there was a particular reason why there was so much time in between. Yeah, that's a really important question. And um, uh, Alfred Gutwald and Diana Schuller looked at it uh, in their studies. I think that's dictated by the SS planning um, the annihilation of the Jews, what trains they have at their disposal, what they plan to do. We do not, for example, until now, at least in my reading, I have not seen a good explanation yet what the Germans actually planned with the family camp in Birkenau. I mean, I have seen colleagues who decide to go with an explanation, but I have not seen a persu persuasive interpretation uh, yet. Um, but for the mentality of the prisoners, when the transport stopped for longer than a month, they believe that they will never again be transports. And this is what is so destructive about the transports. And this is also why after fall 44, kind of the old studies in Shad, as we know it from the uh, exhibitions about children and about art and about Brunibar, it's kind of gone because it kind of really knocks out uh, from people uh, what they were used to. And that's so most of the younger people were sent to Auschwitz. I'm glad you mentioned at the very end of the conclusion about the importance of doing history of the everyday. Um, I think that's such an, you know, a vital part of historical study. Could you maybe tell us for those who haven't read your book a little bit about what you cover in the book and how it fits in with the history of the everyday and, and sort of, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to promote that. Oh, thank you. Um, well, on, on, the, on the danger of being frivolous, buy my book. It, it's not expensive. It's only $34 that I can send you a discount voucher, but also your local support your local bookshop so that you have a bookshop. Because if you don't buy your books from your local bookshop, then it will go bankrupt and it will be horrible. Um, I try to do two things in the book. I write a new modern analytical history of Theresienstadt for people who want to have an English study uh, of Theresienstadt because there is not a short analytical overview of Theresienstadt. There's Hage Adler out in English with Cambridge that costs something like $100 and is, I mean, honestly unreadable. Nobody reads Adler cover to cover. Um, and there are some excellent memoirs. Um, and there is Hage, um, there is Ruth Bundes, um biography of uh, Edelstein. But um, all of these studies have been written by survivors. And they kind of were writing the story as they experienced it. They were settling the accounts of people whom they always disliked. They told the narratives that they were influenced. Um, I am not a survivor of Theresienstadt and all my relatives who were in Theresienstadt did not survive, which, by the way, is one of the reasons why I dedicated the book to the victims, not to the survivors. Um, 
and I wanted to study Theresienstadt as a study of society and extremism. And it's the second thing that my book does. It uh, studies Theresienstadt as a um, case study of prisoner society, not only of ghettos, not only of concentration camps, but um, at uh, larger. I remember in 2015, Alice Goffman's On the Run came out and I found it very inspirational because many of the dynamics and mechanisms that she described and discussed uh, were familiar to me. Similarly, when uh, Origins to Newberg um, came out, I think in 2013. Of course, uh, there are differences, but rather than always stressing how Holocaust is different, I think we are shooting ourselves a little bit in the leg and we should recognize, and that's one of the central claims of uh, my book, is uh, how all societies are somewhat similar, how people have a little bit of leeway, a little bit of uh, agency until the end and how immensely important it is to them, how they make differences, they stress ethnicity, how they talk about being Jewish in the correct way and being Jewish in the wrong way. This is why Arno Schlein describes the poor German Jews as orthodox. The Reisenstadt did not engender a common Jewishness and I think it's a powerful conclusion for our understanding how Jewish history works. In fact, if you want to learn, if I may say so about my own book, important insights about century European Jewry in 19th and early 20th century, the last chapter is in Theresienstadt, but we can kind of tell the history back. So the book um, has six chapters on self-administration, on ethnicity and class, uh, on food and hunger, cooking and starvation as the elderly, on medicine and the stories of the Jewish prisoner, uh, physicians and nurses in Theresienstadt, on culture and cultural life, and also how it was um, uh, encompassed in class and in ethnicity, and finally on transport. And it's not long. I mean, it's a, yeah, it, it's, it's such an interesting book. And I think that um, for many, and this brings me to my final question, I think for many people, this there's a popular view of what Theresienstadt was. Uh, and I think your work does a lot to complicate that. And I wonder if you might be able to speak just a little bit about the popular view and why that might be problematic and how that came into our public consciousness. Yeah, uh, I should say I'm not that terribly tired. So I saw there are more questions and I, I'm thrilled to be in Kansas. So unless you don't want to post questions, I will tell you when I feel like I need to stop. As you see, I'm a fairly straightforward person. Um, so you have these mass narratives of Theresienstadt that emerge already in the ghetto proper and that says that um, Theresienstadt was a site where people who were uh, stigmatized and expelled because of the Jewish background showed that Jews who were always seen as kind of these impractical uh, intellectuals who are only living of someone else could show that they excel at manual labor took care of the weakest, being children, produced meaningful and beautiful pieces of art that were not saliently Jewish, you know, like Barter Bride by Beatrice Smetana, um, and uh, kind of always took care of each other, of place of triumph of human spirit, of human loyalty and solidarity. And this story is not incorrect, but it's a redemptive story. And when you look at Therese in chat more closely, you see the society, how it emerges, at loyalty, at its boundaries, um, at um, international transnational connections, but also some xenophobic moments, at uh, observance of Jewish rights, but also anti-Semitism, where Jews look at other Jews and say, you are Jewish in the wrong way. And that all shows how humans are until the end. And indeed, um, many people thought at length, what does it mean to be in Theresienstadt? And they found out and concluded that in the long run, the raising shut did not make them Jewish, it made them human. That is, <laughs> that's such a, a, in many ways, I feel like that's a, that's a perfect place to, uh, to end us just because that's such a nice, um, yeah. I'm sure nice I will note. come up with something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have a couple more questions about, um, the difference between self-administration and um, functionaries, um, just in terms of how the ghetto itself was managed. I think you, ah, are you back? 
Yeah, I'm back. No, I saw the question and I think it's a very good question and I, I, I use them interchangeably similarly to Theresine and Theresine so that it does not get um, lexically too boring. Is there uh, any, someone asked about the prisoner functionaries versus um, Jewish administration. Uh, sorry, that I, I can't have a powerful end on that. Again, it's, it's, it's lexically the same. Anyone else has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We have someone here you probably saw who did grow up in the Czech Republic and wants to um, say hello. I can see um, Ahoy. So this is, uh, is there anything else that you, we haven't, um, haven't given you opportunity to, to touch on? Oh, I mean, there is so much. I am, um, something that I, uh, looked at at length in the book are uh, the last months of Theresienstadt when the news at long last what have been happening in Auschwitz what has been happening in the east that there is the holocaust that what the holocaust means starts seeping in and you have the interesting epistemological moment in Theresienstadt when the bad news actually always there they come in a number of ways people send postcards from Auschwitz and elsewhere where the words, uh, where the letters G-A-S, gas, uh, have like dots under them. And you see over and over how the recipients read the postcards and conclude something else, something positive. So if uh, Uncle Richard is here and says hi, and you know, Uncle Richard was sent to Sachsenhausen and murdered, then actually, you know, Uncle Richard has never been murdered because he's in Auschwitz. So you always see this kind of interpretation uh, through the positive lens. And yet at the very end, people start obsessing about the SS building these secret structures and they wonder uh, what does it mean? And they start believing that the SS plans to kill them all. Now, I've thought about it long and well, and there is no good explanation what the SS was planning. And if they were actually planning to kill someone, since there is in shot similarly to Bergen Belsen at Mauthausen was one of the destinations where many of the dispatches were sent. Maybe the killing was not actually aimed at the people in Theresienstadt, but at the people from the dispatches. But in the end, we do not know that. But the very same people who for three years received over and over many, many news, um, be it by eyewitnesses, by postcards, by radio, by whatnot, uh, and refused to believe them, now start obsessing that they will die. And my explanation for it, and now I'm kind of crunching a, uh, a more subtle uh, and differentiated explanation from the book, is kind of the explanations over the years did not go away. They always stayed at the back of their mind. And people in Theresienstadt, and I have described how it is a transit ghetto and how everybody who stays after four transports is a very small remnant who has seen so many people go who somehow were able to avoid that because they were ranked as indispensable, because they were important, because they were married to the correct person, because they had the correct job and so on. But largely the people who stay in November 44 are people who are ranked really, really important that are extremely lucky, but also um, have a high social uh, capital. I mean, I'm generalizing here. And they develop something like a bad consciousness. And with the transport psychology to excuse why they have survived by everyone else, all their friends, all their lovers, all their relatives have been sent to the East and therefore are not alive anymore. They themselves need to be in mortal danger. And therefore they prepare kind of this explanation of these uh, mysterious uh, buildings. Um, and they believe it very much. So I do not think I will persuade anyone who has gone through that because we have very powerful psychological mechanisms to explain things to us, especially uh, when uh, faced with such trauma. And I gave you the example, the example of Eva Mendlova and only reading it. And you know, I have read that bit certainly 30 years and I have read it a lot many times and it hits me again and again how brutal it is. And um, we know what people do for explanations in face of COVID and of vaccination and of cancer. And yet the danger and the stress is not as high. 
you started with a, a modern, like a picture of today uh, and what is left of the site. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, how it's been preserved, memorialization of the site and, and yeah, your, your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I showed the picture because that is in Shadesta kind of fortunate uh, moment because not that much um, has changed. Uh, some of the buildings have been renovated. Um, uh, after the war, the Czechoslovak army uh, moved in again. It was a fortress. It was a military town before the occupation. It was a military town until well in the uh, 90s or maybe even in the 2000s. Um, and there is a couple of modern buildings, but largely 95% of it is as is. It's a poor town. Uh, people don't do so well. And there is basically the bubble of the memorial. Then you have the bubble of the visitors. And by the way, that is in really suffered uh, with COVID because so many people would live off the tourists. They would come in the morning and go in the afternoon, but still they would um, go to eat somewhere. And now this is all gone. I visited just two, three weeks ago um, and it has changed uh, quite a bit. What's interesting that none of the tourists actually want to stay on site. They all go back uh, to Prague. It's one hour uh, by car. It's about, I think, 40 miles. Um, and um, the locals have kind of very mixed feelings about all of this because for them, Terezin is the town they live. It's the place they really like. And they feel uncomfortable about the German, and American, and Israel, and sometimes also Czech visitors who come and imply to them that they should not live there, that they should not laugh, they should not eat ice cream, they should not uh, smoke around and kiss and uh, maybe sometimes get drunk. And actually a good friend of mine, um, uh, Alice lives in Terezin and um, she was sharing with me uh, these insights that she drives her Škodovka and she wants to be able to drive and another tourist who do not walk on the sidewalk, they walk through the city center and she's happy for them to come and visit, but can they walk like normal people? And yet I often hear from uh, visitors uh, from second and third generation um, uh, that they are really annoyed. How come they are the locals? How come they live there? Is it not desegregation? How come they actually dare to lick ice cream? And what I'm trying to say with all this, we should really reflect on the clash of these two worlds and make space for both of them, but also especially for the locals, because the locals are not well off and they are not middle class and they don't speak a bunch of languages. And the tourists are in the economically fit situation that they can come and go. And people in Terezin maybe will go every few years on holiday to Croatia. So I think it is good to reflect on being a bit of a colonizing position to go there and say locals, say to the locals, what's what's the rule? Because, well, anyways, I know that US has been having its own bill um, uh, reckoning and it's it's overdue. So I guess we should have the same reckoning when we go and visit um, Woj or Warsaw, that is in Stadt. Well, I think it's so interesting for, I mean, being in the U.S., going to Europe, I think for many people, they forget the layers of history that are that people live with every day. Um, that's very different from, I mean, certainly we, we have some layers and plenty of reckoning to do in the U.S. for sure. Um, but I think that it's, people forget how these landscapes exist in the same space uh, and time and that these are real places that real people live. So I really, um, really appreciate that insight for sure. Thank you again for joining us. Um, this was a wonderful talk, and I, I, I really hope that everyone has a chance to, to read the book as well. So thank you again to Dr. Heikova. Thank you to everyone who's joined us today. I'd like to just give a quick reminder that our next um, Zoom in the Auschwitz Speaker Series will be Beth grish Polelli, who will be speaking September 13th at 6.30 p.m., also by Zoom. Um, she will be speaking on Hitler's first victims, the Nazi forced sterilization program, and the Euthanasia Project. So um, again, September 13th. 6.30 p.m. The David Marwell program we had scheduled in person has now been postponed, uh, so just check our, our site for that. I will have a video uh, of our, our talk this afternoon uh, we'll, that will be available on our website um, if you'd like to, to review that again. Uh, thanks to everyone and to our partners at Union Station. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>